why are there not ag tech companies helping our farm? Tim, what, what, what gives we, we have had this podcast for six years and, uh, you know, 90%. I'm just kidding. One, two, three. Coming up on episode 332 of The Modern Acre, we're talking precision agriculture with Ariel Patton. The Modern Acre podcast explores business, investing, technology, and sustainability in agriculture, and we're your hosts, Tyler and Tim Ness. If you'd like to dig deeper with The Modern Acre, be sure to check out our membership community, The Modern Acre Co-op. The Modern Acre is presented by Local Line. Start 2024 off right with Local Line. Local Line is the all in one sales platform for farms and food hubs of all sizes. Increase your sales and streamline your processes with features including e commerce, inventory management, subscriptions, online payments, and more. Trusted by thousands of farmers in seven countries, Local Line is the platform you need to take your farm to the next level. Subscriptions start as low as $49 per month. Try Local Line today and receive a free premium feature for one year. And receive 15% off Local Line's marketing services using our coupon code MODERNACRE. So, Tim, I'm excited to dig into this conversation with Ariel about precision agriculture. These are one of these areas of ag tech that gets kind of thrown about. We don't really know what is precision ag, what is it not. We were chatting with Ariel, getting prepped for our conversation, and she she threw a little shade at us, Tim. Mm-hmm. She did. Yeah, she made a joke that this is going to be our last episode before the Super Bowl. The Niners are in the Super Bowl. And we th- she thought we were going to cannibalize the intro with 49ers chatter. And it might happen. It might happen. This is something I actually talked to Tim about is, Tim, we've got to cool it on the Niners and some of this other you know, banter back and forth. Maybe we keep that more for Acre Insights. And Ariel picked up on it, Tim. Ariel knows me and her are on the same page. But we have to talk a little bit. This is our last episode before the Super Bowl. Tim and I both have no plans <laughs> uh, <laughs> because we're both, I don't know how to describe us. Are we just like angry old men that want to be left alone during the football game? How would you describe it? We're, we're both actually kind of on the same page about this. I've talked to a few guys that are in the same camp where they just kind of like want to be alone. They're like really into the team and want to focus on the game. And like when you throw the party atmosphere in there, there's like people that aren't paying attention. People that have watched like two Niners games all year that are just like don't know what they're talking about, kind of interjecting. And sometimes you just got to like focus on the game and just zone in, which is what I like to do. (laughs) My my skin is crawling at the thought of just some, some uninformed fan like making some ridiculous comment about Brock Purdy or ab- about Patrick Mahomes or Taylor Swift. And yeah, I like even the thought of it right now is making me repulsed. Yeah. Just some mid coming in saying like Brendan, Ayuk cause he caught a pass all year. Be like, dude, come on, watch the, watch the film. I, yeah, I'm going to be alone with my family. No party planned. Um, I'll, I'll plan the party for when the chargers are in the Super Bowl or something. But in the spirit of making this intro short, we have a great conversation with Ariel today talking about precision agriculture and dig into to all of the all of the nuances, what it means for ag tech in general, how AI plays a role, and how we're thinking about precision ag on Nest Farms as well. So before we jump in, make sure you're subscribed to Ariel's newsletter, Topsoil. The link is in the show notes for you guys to sign up if you haven't already. Let's jump into this conversation. All right, Ariel, we are back with a, another conversation around your newsletter, Topsoil. I think this is the first one of the year. It feels good to be back and chatting about agriculture and, you know, agriculture at, dare I say, just the right depth. And uh, I'm excited to talk about today precision agriculture. So why don't you kick us off with why you decided to go to Precision Ag next and kind of how you approached this one? Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, it's great to be back. And so with this edition, I'm experimenting with a couple new things. One is I actually took a page from your guys' book and interviewed an expert to get a lot more 
in-depth information on a on a new topic and then still put it in that same easy to read simple top soil framework. So really excited to uh, to dive deep on precision ag with you guys. For this edition, like I have worked on some precision ag software, some variable rate software, but there's so much beneath the surface in precision ag. So I really wanted to get an expert um, who's been there, done that, seen it from, you know, near beginnings. And so I reached out to a former colleague um, and friend of mine, Greg Chiaco. And Greg leads product at a company called Farmwise today. So Farmwise, I don't know if you guys have had anyone on from there, but they have some really neat technology, a robotic weeding implement and, and other technology um, to help vegetable farmers, uh, Tim, Nest Farms, you know, maybe, weed their vegetables with much less labor. So Greg's experience really goes back 20 plus years. He um, previously worked at Trimble and Topcon, which are some pretty big names in the precision ag space. And and um, since then has, you know, we met at Granular and, and he also had worked at Mineral as well previous um, to his time at FarmWise, as well as the Climate Corporation. Yeah, I, I love how you're approaching it. And, you know, you said you took a page out of our book. Really, Tim and I aren't that smart. And so uh, when we started the podcast, we're like, how do we talk to people that are smarter than us and give them a platform to share? And, you know, that's what we're even doing with with you and Topsoil and all the great insights that you have distilled. But I love that interviewing an expert and going deep on a specific topic is is super smart. I loved the addition. So let's get into like, what is precision agriculture? I think that you kind of start your addition talking about how it's this ubiquitous term, a la regenerative agriculture, all, you know, like it's one of these words that we don't really know exactly what it means. So why don't we start there? Definitely. And precision ag is one of those that you hear a lot and it describes a lot of different things. Someone will say, you know, a yield monitor, that's precision ag. Farm management software, yeah, that's precision ag. Scouting with a drone, precision ag. Variable rate, precision ag. So those are all really different things. And so it was always a little bit confusing. When you look at some of the like textbook definitions, one that was sent my way is, you know, it's a management strategy that takes account of temporal and spatial variability. So that is maybe helpful, but I think it's still kind of this dense concept. And so one of the things that I broke down um, with Greg was how do we how do we make sense of that? And so if you think about your farm equipment moving across the field doing a certain task. Precision ag is really that additional layer of technology that goes on top of those machines to really make each action more precise, um, both the when and the where being more precise. Yeah, I think like something that I think took me a while to understand is the fact and reality that farming and agriculture is outdoor manufacturing. And I think when you look at agriculture through that lens, the idea of precision agriculture actually makes makes more sense. Because like, if we just think about manufacturing, right, like, I think manufacturing has always gotten incrementally more precise, right, as technology has developed, and the equipment that's being used and automation for manufacturing, and it's repeatable. That's the key part of the manufacturing process. It's repeatable. Every step is repeatable. In agriculture, in farming, it's it's way different because you're outdoors in the conditions. And then you talked about this in, in the addition is you have soil types that can vary even within a within a given field you have sloping that happens so it's not just even you know the equipment that's touching the ground is touching it at different levels or orientations through throughout the farming process you have microclimates you have all these different factors and then you have yeah even the health of the soil of what was planted there before so it's just way 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 more complex and so when you view it in that lens, it makes sense that given these constraints and because of technology advancements, we can actually now not really come close to uh, indoor manufacturing, but we can we can get closer with the help of technology that we weren't able to do previously. 
I think that's a great way of looking at it, Tyler. And another lens that I had been thinking about when writing this is that when we think about ag at like the smallest scale, like your garden or or even like a market garden operation, it's a person or many people in a lot of cases kind of caring for each plant or each row, really, really small areas, and they can give attention to to each area and 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 take account into of that variability that you mentioned. And then as we think about agriculture scaling up, like you said, like it's manufacturing without a roof, then we get to equipment that's running across an entire field. And without precision ag, it's treating the whole field roughly the same, whether or not that's true with all the other agronomic conditions. And then I think we're where we're at with precision ag is we're kind of getting back to that you know, plant or row or section management, but instead of requiring a massive number of people to do that, um, we're able to use technology. And and that's been made possible by different uh, underlying technology advancements, like having GPS uh, and different measuring and, and monitoring and data management, all these underlying technologies that come together that actually allow precision ag to be possible. Yeah, I think the scale issue is is super important. I think a lot of people don't realize like how critical that is. Like just looking at one bell pepper field that we have this year, there's over a million plants in that one field. And that's one of, you know, 25 plus fields that we have. So think about tending for a million plus plants is pretty crazy when you think about farming that scale and I think the challenge has been kind of commercializing this technology for all the different crop types and all the different nuances that we've talked about where a lot of where this is being deployed is in the Midwest on on corn and beads and row crop. We we talked to Jorge, the co-founder of Blue River on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and they their early trials were in the Salinas Valley working on leafy greens. And when they actually like got some traction with John Deere, they ultimately pivoted to going to, to row crops. And so uh, being a farmer in California, like I see all this technology and precision ag, and like, oh, this is so awesome. I wish we could have like variable rate application, but like a lot of the crops that we grow, there's just not models or companies focused on kind of like smaller, smaller crops within California. Yeah, Tim. And I think that's what's interesting, kind of calling back to one of our conversations about the different economics of specialty crops and row crops with with the really tight margins, but large volumes and areas for row crops. I think that's where a lot of this technology has been commercialized um, or is is kind of leading. But, you know, I, I know you and I walked the show at FIRA uh, a few months back and and saw some really cool, maybe more specialty focused tools there. So hopefully, hopefully more to come for, for specialty crops as the cost of labor go up. Um, these solutions might make more sense. Ariel, maybe let's dig into the different sections of precision precision agriculture that you lay out. There's one component that's focused on data collection and one part that's more machine control. Maybe just talk to us about the different segmentation within precision agriculture that you laid out. Yeah. And so, as I mentioned earlier, precision ag is this very large tent that a lot of different technologies fit under. And at one point I was wondering, is it even a useful terminology? Is it just like all ag is precise to some extent? But I think when you go to shows like Farm Progress, like there's still a precision ag area. And I, and I think we still think of it as this separate additional layer. So we broke down all the different types of precision ag solutions into these different buckets. And like you mentioned, there's, think of it as two halves. There's one half that's really about the machine control. So your tractor or implement control. And then the other half is really around data and and what we can do with that data. So on the machine control side, you know, there's the auto steer and we could talk about that a little bit more, but can your tractor go in a straight line or, you know, a GPS guided precise line? There's a lot of precision ag that's made a huge difference for farmers around machine control. So controlling the boom height as you're rolling over a field um, with height variability, like different things that allow the actual tractor to adjust. And then part of that too is variable rate technology. And that's where the tractor is applying or the equipment is applying inputs at really site-specific rates. So you're planting 
more corn seed in an area where there's going to have a higher yield potential. You know, you're applying fertility where it's needed, not where it's going to wash out. So that's that variable rate technology. On the data side, we also have conveniently three categories. Um, we've got, you know, data analysis. That's just collecting and analyzing data across the farm. Mapping, I think because you guys obviously know this, like so much of ag is so dependent on your field and what's going on in that field. There's a ton of really interesting technology that has to do with mapping and just giving farmers information about what's happening within that field. And then machine analytics um, around how much was this equipment, uh, how much is this equipment being used? Where is it in the field? I remember one of uh, the farmers I had worked with previously uh, had talked about his wife's favorite feature was being able to see exactly where he was in the field and um, and knowing, you know, how far or close he was from home. Did he, you know, make a, a pit stop, anything like that? So there's some really interesting machine analytics as well around where equipment is um, that can be used for a whole variety of purposes. That reminds me of like my, I don't wear an Apple watch anymore, but my favorite feature of the Apple watch was to ping my iPhone. So I know where, <laughs> where, my, where my phone is. Um, sometimes it's the little things. But Tim, I, I was thinking we, we should chat a little bit more about how we're thinking about precision ag on our farm. I think that we largely have not really taken advantage of or invested a ton in precision ag. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Most notably, Tim, what comes to mind for me is I think precision ag becomes more challenging as you incorporate more complexity and more crops, right? So we have, what is it, Tim, 10 crops um, every year um, about. And those crops are not staying in the same location every year. So, so not only do we have 10 crops, those 10 are changing on every given year, right? We're adding one, subtracting two, and then they're changing locations of the fields. So that just creates some challenges to maximize the benefit of precision ag versus a corn field that's being planted in corn every year that's 10,000 acres, right? Where um, you can kind of put that same technology la- layer, that same model across the whole farm. So Tim, yeah, what, what are your, what, you can maybe speak to what we what we have used, what, what we don't use and your thoughts on that. Yeah, pretty good overview of like some of the challenges that, that we've had, like just operationally, how we operate as a farm, having multiple different crops. And for us, it, it's kind of hard because we Beyond just the, what you just described, Ty, we have different bed configurations where some crops are on 40-inch beds, some are on 60s, some are on 80s. So to invest in equipment that's like static to a certain configuration that's variable is, is pretty challenging. And like Ty, you and I have talked to hundreds of different ag tech companies, and a lot of them aren't focused on crops that we grow. Like if they are focused on specialty crops, it's probably permanents like almonds or vineyard type crops or leafy greens in the Salinas Valley, where um, there's still, I, I think, a pretty big need for crops that that we grow that are just not top of the priority list for a lot of these companies that are developing the tech. Um, I think some of the challenges still are just kind of the, the adoption, like Ariel, you mentioned in the addition about the adoption of, of auto steering, where it just seems like every tractor has auto steering at this point, but the adoption curve has been very, very slow on this kind of like 30 plus year old technology. And um, I think that adoption curve just lags in agriculture, I think pr- partly due to cost, partly due to to use case where some of these technologies just aren't fully functional in every every situation. And so that's why the adoption curve is lacked. For us, the investment like this year, we, we've talked about weeding on previous conversation about technology being deployed there. And like the investment we're making this year is for finger weeders. So it's like very, very low tech. It's going to be an opportunity for us to try those in tomatoes this year to make the investment. It's not a, a million dollar laser weeder. It's not a, a smart cultivator, but it's something that's kind of like moving in that direction um, that hopefully will eliminate some hand weeding and kind of step in that direction. And it's, you know, a hundredth of the cost. So it's an investment that we can make to start moving in that direction. Yeah, Tim, it's interesting to hear kind of that progression for your for your farm and how you're thinking about What's the crawl, walk, run sequence there? Makes a ton of sense to to start and see the the ROI that you get and and go from there. All right, so I have two questions. One, why are there not ag tech companies helping our farm? 
Tim. What 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 gives? We we have had this podcast for six years, and uh, you know, ninety percent. I'm just kidding. Okay, so that that's question one. <laughs> question two is for Ariel. Is you know, I read about precision agriculture. It it all makes sense to me. We've talked to a number of different ad tech startups that are playing, you know, in in this space. And my my question is like, can AI solve all this? Like, is is AI really like the thing that takes us over the tipping point, right? Because that's where I see the most opportunity in ag tech is because of all these different factors. Like, it's stuff that is hard for humans to be able to make the right decision based on all this data input, based on technology on the machines to to provide a solution that is cost efficient and has a good return on investment for farmers. I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, is AI the answer? Is that going to kind of <laughs> send us over the tipping point? That is, it's a great question. I think that AI is, it's already doing really incredible things. And at the same time, I think of it as an enabling technology. It's it's an underlying technology that needs to be combined with other technologies that are available, and it has to solve a real problem. And I think in the case of Precision Ag, of course, there's there's a lot of problems that Precision Ag solves from, you know, environmental sustainability, doing more with less, our favorite um, industry rallying cry, you know, saving time for farmers. You know, there's a lot of a lot of benefits there. But I think that what AI is helping us do is kind of usher in this this next wave of precision ag. And a lot of I think one of the things that that I discussed with Greg is that the machine needs to know where it is and what it's doing to be able to handle the variability to really act precisely. I think AI is another tool that allows us to do that better. Um, or in addition to what we already have. So today, a lot of machines use GPS, ping satellites in the air. They know exactly where that piece of equipment is to a certain extent, you know, depending on, on there's a lot of factors that, that change how well um, we know, you know, how precise that is. But I think with AI, what we're seeing um, a lot of is, you know, technologies like computer vision. So using cameras to, help the equipment know where it is, know what it's doing, um, to be able to detect what's a weed, what's not a weed, what's a pest, that kind of thing. So I do think there's some really cool new capabilities that are coming to market. And at the same time, uh, you know, there's there's no silver bullet. Uh, I want to be a realist. And so much of these really buzzy and promising technologies come down to how it's applied and how it can be incorporated into the farmer's existing um, job and operation. One thing that that was interesting to me as I as I chatted with Greg is that I think for a long time, as a you know ag tech industry, we've been really afraid to change anything that the farmer's doing or to even ask them to because they're so busy. They've got a million and one constraints as to why they're doing things the way that they're doing. He's been seeing more and more that as the value of some of these tools um, are becoming more apparent, that farmers are willing to make certain changes like field configuration or watering schedule in order to accommodate some of these technologies. So maybe AI can help increase the value a little bit more to, to ease that adoption curve. Um, but I, I think as everything in ag, it's going to be a long journey and, and time will tell. Yeah, I think well said. There's a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon, but the practicality of executing the crops today with the tools we have is is important. So it's a, a crawl, walk, run approach to get these technologies deployed on field. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Ariel. Check out our newsletter, Topsoil. Make sure you're subscribed there. We're going to be back next week. Win or lose, Tim. Niners, win or lose. We'll be back next week because... There's more to life than football, Tim. So we just got to remind ourselves that and see how we're feeling on Monday. It could be one of extreme elation or extreme despair. So looking forward to that.